Maximilian Kolbe had a heroic life of virtue that's even recognized in the secular culture. How you live is impacted by what you believe. So what did Maximilian Kolbe believe? What was his driving force? What was his fixed ideal that caused him to do such heroic things that we want to imitate? He was born on January 8, 1894. He was baptized Raymond Colby in a very devout family. And one day he was being very precocious to his mother and she said to him kind of an exasperation, what's gonna become of you, Raymond? As a little kid, it kind of struck him to his heart that he went over to the parish church, which was across the street. And he went in front of the image of Our Lady and he said to Our Lady in a very childlike way, well, Mother Mary, what is going to become of me? Then Our Lady appeared to him holding out two crowns, a red crown and a white crown. And she said, my son, if you choose the red crown, you will die a martyr for the faith. If you choose the white crown, you'll have purity for God. He looked at them and he said, I choose both. Crowns represent victory. The side altar that Maximilian Kolbe was at and the Virgin Mary appeared to him was Our Lady of Victory. Our Lady was offering Maximilian Kolbe the path to victory. So from a young child, he knew if I'm gonna win, it's gonna be with, in, and through Mary. The conventional Franciscans came to his parish and preached a parish mission, and he was taken by their zeal for Our Lady. He and his brother Francis both decided to become conventional Franciscans. He made his first profession, and they sent him off to Rome to study. 1917 was the 200th anniversary of the founding of the first Masonic Lodge in England. And so they were celebrating in Rome the founding of the Freemasons. They went in a long procession right down the Via Conciliazione, which is the street that leads right up to the Vatican. And they processed around the square carrying a stuffed image of St. Michael the Archangel being stomped on by the devil. And they said, the devil will rule in the Vatican. The Pope will be a slave of the devil. And that shocked St. Maximilian Kolbe to see these men glorying in their service to the devil. And he said, if these men can be in the possession of the devil, then there should be those who can also be possessed by Our Lady to help defeat them. From that demonstration that he witnessed, he was inspired to form what later on became known as the Militia Immaculate, the Knights of the Immaculata. And he founded it with a few of his friars becoming the first members. And you have that paper where they all signed their name to becoming the first members of the MI, in which he listed just briefly what the conditions were for there to be in the MI. Maximilian Kolbe founded the Militia of the Immaculata on October 16, 1917. That date is extraordinarily significant. In Fatima, for that past six months, the Virgin Mary had been appearing to the shepherd children, saying to them, my son wishes to establish in the world devotion to my Immaculate Heart. Many souls will be saved through my Immaculate Heart. My Immaculate Heart will be your refuge. In the end, my Immaculate Heart will triumph. So what Mary is giving at an apparition, at the same time, Maximilian Kolbe is developing through theology. For Maximilian Kolbe, Mary is not a pious devotion. For Maximilian Kolbe, Mary is clear science. He received a double doctorate in philosophy and theology. He was sent back to Poland, and it's there that he asked permission of his superiors if he could form a group and live out this pursuing of Our Lady's mission. He got property donated to him. That would later on become what is known as Niepokalanov, which in Polish means City of the Immaculate. It reached over 700 friars. Because he had the heart of Mary from prayer, he had a passionate urgency to save as many souls as possible 
as fast as possible and the fastest, easiest way was to get a soul to love the Virgin Mary. Once they said yes to the Virgin Mary, the Virgin Mary doesn't lose. She crushes the head of the serpent and she gives birth to Christ in the soul of that individual. And he was so zealous, he used every means of technology available to him. He was experimenting in television, radio, he wanted to make movies. He was having friars train how to fly a plane so that they could fly their publications to different cities in Europe. He had the finest printing presses in the world at that time, the Heidelberg Press. And his printing presses were running 24 hours, six days out of the week. So that when a friar would get out of the bed in the morning, a friar who was working all night on the printing press would go to sleep and they'd have their own religious life. They worked at night. And so he had a beehive of activity for Our Lady. Well, if Maximilian Kolbe was alive today, he would be on TikTok. He would be on YouTube. He would have a podcast. If there's a metaverse, I give you my word, Maximilian Kolbe would have somebody in the metaverse. Why? Because that's where people are at. Regardless of nationality, regardless of language, this was his driving, passionate, fixed ideal. So much so he went to Japan. He didn't speak Japanese. He was only there for a month, and he already started publishing his magazine in Japanese. You say, well, how could he do that in such a short time when he didn't know any Japanese when he went there? Such confidence in Our Lady. When you think of St. Maximilian Kolbe being in Japan, people might think, oh, he had such zeal and all this energy, but physically he was very weak. He was pretty much sick all the time that he was in Japan. And he was sometimes so weak that they had to support him under both arms in order for him to say Mass. When he was a young priest, he came down with tuberculosis of the lungs. When he was in Nagasaki, he only had half of a lung. But he was doing all these things for Ali. That is such a miracle that he was able to accomplish. You know, when you're sick, you can't think very well sometimes or constantly. Because Maximilian Kolbe had the habit of consulting with Our Lady before every decision, when it was time to build his friary, despite practical wisdom, he said Mary wants the friary on this side of the mountain. And because of that, later in 1945, when the U.S. drops the atomic bomb on Nagasaki, the community of Franciscan conventuals that Maximilian founded was spared from the atomic blast. In 1936, Maximilian is re-elected as the father guardian of the city of the Immaculate in Poland. And this is when his final test begins. World War II broke out and eventually Nyepakalana was taken over by the German soldiers and they sent most of the friars, they said, go, leave. St. Maximilian Kolbe and only a few friars left there to manage the place. The one last article that he printed was all about truth. It didn't even directly speak about Nazis. And the Germans, of course, were not happy with him and his speaking, you might say, anything was contradictory to what they were trying to promote. So they went to arrest him. Maximilian Kolbe was made into another Christ. It is the role of the Immaculata to make the body of Christ. So the more I surrender, the more I say, yes, Mary, I'm yours. The more I say, Mary, what is your will? Let it be done to me according to thy word. The more she makes me like Christ. And we see this played out in Maximilian Kolbe's heroic death. No greater love has a man than this, to give up his life for his friends. When St. Maximilian Kolbe arrived at Auschwitz, they would tell the prisoners when they arrived, if you're a priest, expect to live this long. If you're this, expect to live this long. And if you don't like it, go throw yourself on the electric wire right now. That was the welcome talk of the Nazi guards. Ironically, it says at Auschwitz, our Bach macht frei, work makes free. But it was the most enslaved place there was. And of course, Auschwitz was not just a place where they wanted to work you hard. They wanted to be a place that they also wanted to destroy your hope. St. Maximilian Kolbe, he was having to do this hard manual labor of digging, moving trees, and when he didn't work fast enough, they would beat him. But yet he would take everything with great patience and calm. Many of them found it very difficult. When you're being persecuted, you start taking it out on everybody else. He was always encouraging them to be charitable and not to let 
the sufferings around them discourage them. You know, he would say, offer to the Immaculate. She will make use of this. When he had a moment of rest, he was giving the other prisoners lectures in theology. He's in this living hell on earth and he's giving a lecture to the other prisoners about the Holy Trinity and what heaven will be like. They also had a policy that if one man escaped from your section, they would take 10 of those prisoners and they would starve him to death. So that was to discourage you from wanting to escape because you knew if you escaped, 10 people would die because you got out. So one day the work crew came in and they were missing one prisoner. The commandant had all the people in St. Maximin Colby's block stand in attention in the hot summer sun for hours. And then Commandant Fritsch would go through their lines as they were lined up and he'd say, you, you, you. And whoever he pointed to, that would be the person who was selected to go and be starved in the starvation bunker. The last man he pointed to was Franciszek Gajewniczek, who when he was selected, he cried out, my wife, my children, I'll never see them again. And St. Maximilian Kolbe, who was not selected, but was maybe a few rows behind, he broke rank and walked up to Commandant Fritsch. And he said, I wish to take this man's place. And the Commandant Fritsch looked at it, St. Maximilian Kolbe and said, who are you? He said, I am a Catholic priest. He said, I don't care what pig dies. And he switched them. When men were chosen and they were starving in the bunker, they would hear them crying, swearing, cursing God, blaspheming. It furthered the anxiousness and the despair of the other prisoners to hear these men crying out. They would find sometimes prisoners were starting to eat other prisoners, you know, bite on them and trying to even drink their own urine because it's a horrible thing to be starved to death. He didn't want them to die that way. He wanted to make sure they would die a good and provided for death. So instead of them hearing all those other things that he heard, they heard them praying the rosary, singing hymns to Our Lady. It became like a little chapel. This bunker, this little deeper part of hell, you might say, became the spiritual chapel of Auschwitz, where the men who were not in the starvation bunker, they would go and sit and stand outside and pray along with them and sing along with these men as they were dying. But as one by one the men died, and the voices of the praying and that got lesser and lesser, after about two weeks, the Nazis wanted to clear out that room. And when they sent the German nurse in there, they found St. Maximilian Kolbe laying on the floor with this great light emanating from him. So much that the nurse said, don't look at me, priest, don't look at me. He said, raise your arm. And St. Maximilian Kolbe raised his arm and he injected him with carbolic acid and the other men and killed them quickly. That's why St. Maximilian Kolbe is the patron saint of drug addicts. That was the, the heroic act of St. Maximilian Kolbe, not just saving Franciszek Gajemniczek, but helping these other men die holy deaths. In his life, he had this dream or this vision that he was floating over Poland, and he always wondered what that meant. He didn't know, why am I getting this vision about me floating over Poland? Well, in his death on August 14th, 1941, literally did he float over Poland because they put him, of course, in the crematorium in Auschwitz, and they burned his body. His ashes went up through the chimney, and the wind took his ashes over Poland. This vision that he had was fulfilled. Maximilian Kolbe had a great saying, if it's not within your control, be assured it is the sure will of the Immaculata. Anything that happens to you is the will of Mary, even the bad things. When the Nazis came, when they knocked on the door to take him away to the horrible concentration camp where he'd be treated as less than a human, Maximilian Kolbe said, yes, Mary. When it was his time to take the place of the other man, he saw in that the will of the Immaculata, yes, Mary. And so no matter how bad the circumstance, all things work for the good of those who love the Lord and how much better for those who love Mary. Yes, Mary. And with his final breath, he pushed out his arm and said, finally, one last time, yes, Mary, thy will be done. And because of that, he became not just a great saint, one of the greatest saints who John Paul II called the prophet for the new millennium. We've been praying for a new springtime in the church for the power of the Holy Spirit to come upon us. Maximilian Kolbe would say, Amen. And the Holy Spirit will come alive in you with, in, and through Mary. To the degree that you become Marianized, that is to the degree that you will be renewed by the power of the Holy Spirit. And so with Maximilian Kolbe, let us say, Yes, Mary. 
Join me in prayer in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Mary, Mother of the Church, I come before you in the spirit of St. Maximilian Kolbe, who consecrated his Franciscan life and work to you without reserve. You accepted Maximilian's self-offering, accept me. You led Maximilian to Christ, lead me. You formed Maximilian into a mirror of Christ, form me. Your union with Maximilian provided the backdrop for his works of evangelization and heroic acts of charity. Please grant through the intercession of St. Maximilian that I might fully collaborate with you and the Holy Spirit as an instrument for the upbuilding of Christ's church. Amen.